morning, and welcome to the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce's webinar on ESG in Brazil, Developments and Prospects, the first of many webinars, hopefully, on the subject. I am John Welch, the Executive Director of the Chamber. First and foremost, we wish you and your family's health and happiness in this difficult time. Thank you for joining us. Also, we'd like to especially thank Cozan for sponsoring the event. Corporations and financial institutions are increasingly looking at ESG, that is environmental, security, and corporate governance, to reduce risk and increase performance in the long in a long-term scenario. Prior to COVID-19, there was already a meaningful focus on ESG investing. The pandemic could prove a major turning point for ESG as sustainable funds outperform the traditional market for the year. Today, we bring together ESG experts to discuss ESG practices and metrics already adopted by companies and financial institutions before and during COVID-19, as well as new market trends in sustainable investing. Our moderator today is Felipe Neves, who is the founder of ESG Brazil, an independent platform specializing in environment, uh, security, and corporate governance. Content and practices. ESG Brazil works to dis disseminate, recognize, and discuss ESG, addressing the best initiatives and practices of Brazil around the world. Mr. Nevis is a lawyer and currently an international associate at Cleary Gottlieb Steen in Hamilton. He is also a fellow of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce's Person of the Year Fellowship Program. Mr. Nevis graduated from Stanford Law School and Puc in Sao Paulo. Our first panelist is Paula Kowarski, who is Cozan's Investor Relations Officer, a position she has held since June, 19, uh, June 2015. In addition to leading Cozan's group in, New York, in the New York office and the ESG agenda. Previously, she worked at Itao BBA as head of the, the equity research team, head of LATAM oil and gas and petrochemicals at Heavy Utilities. Before that, she worked at Shell for 10 years as business development manager with gas and power and exploration and production. Ms. Kovarsi holds a degree in production engineering from Bukio and MBA in finance from Ibemex. Fabio, our second uh, panelist, Fabio Alperwich, is partner and co-founder of Thumb Investimentos, where he is responsible for managing the equity fund of Brazilian companies, focusing on companies with social responsibility and adhering to ESP path practices. He started his career at Procter & Gamble, and he served as founder and director of the following NGOs, Fama Institute, Brazil Israel Institute, Todos de Tete uh, Institute. He is a board member of the WWF Brazil, GRI Brazil, Conscious Capitalism Brazil, and the Jewish Museum of Sao Paulo, and is a member of the TNFB Working Group. He is also a member of the board of directors of several publicly traded companies. Mr. Aperovich graduated in business administration from the Fundação de Arts in Sao Paulo with extension courses at UC Berkeley and the Harvard Kennedy School. And finally, Dan Biller is economics executive in residence at the Comer Graduate School of Business at Rawlings College, joining in 2019 from the World Bank Group. While at the World Bank Group, he held several managerial and technical positions, most recently as the manager of the economics unit in the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, or MIGA, the political risk uh, insurance arm of the institution. He previously served as su su uh, sustainable development lead economist for the World Bank Southeast Asia South Asia region, lead economist for the East Asia and Pacific region and environment and natural resources program leader at the World Bank Institute, a senior economist at the OECD, and has worked with the private sector and governments on infrastructure and mining, hydrocarbon regulatory issues, um, while he was at, on the staff of the Fundação de Duvari. Dr. Biller received his PhD and master's degree in economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a bachelor's degree in economics uh, with a minor in geophysics from the University of Kansas. You can find all their bios on the link on the reminder that was sent yesterday and on the Chamber's website. Before turning the screen over to Felipe, I would ask you to please use the Q&A tab for questions. You can make them at any time and we will look to answer them after the, panel, after the, the initial uh, discussion and we get into the Q&A period. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I will turn the screen over to Felipe. Felipe? Thank you, John. Uh, I'd like to thank you. Thank you all for joining this webinar, especially the Chamber, uh, Paula, Fabio, and Dan for accepting this invitation. Uh, I'm 
really happy to be here today to talk about to talk more about ESG in Brazil with such remarkable panelists. Um, today we will discuss the history of ESG, ESG practices already adopted by companies and financial institutions, as well as new market trends in sustainable investing. So I would like to start asking each of our panelists about the history of ESG investing, uh, their personal and professional experience with ESG, and also what are the overall benefits for investor, investors and companies. So first, Fabio, as you are considered a pioneer of ESG investing in Brazil, could you please share your story with ESG and how ESG started in Brazil? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Felipe. And first of all, thank you very much for the chamber, for the invitation. Good morning, everyone. And, and I hope everyone is, is healthy and safe in this, in this pandemic. Well, uh, I started my company back in 1993, already under the pillars of ESG. The acronym ESG uh, was was born in 2000, between 2004 and 2005. But much before that, uh, the responsible investment was already in place, and several uh, uh, investors around the world uh, were already um, doing that. However, in Brazil, the, it looks like uh, very new because um, now we are flooded with a lot of news in every newspaper, in the mainstream newspapers, every single day about ESG. So it looks like it's a very new and trendy, but it's not new and it's not trendy. Uh, the pillars and the fundamentals of the ESG are basically human rights, uh, environmental issues, and also corporate governance. In the financial market in Brazil, we have been discussing a lot about corporate governance since uh, the 90s. But unfortunately, uh, the human rights and um, the environmental issues have not been discussed uh, in the financial market for, in the, for the financial market participants uh, over the, the, the last decades. So uh, it looks like it's a very new theme and it's very complex, but it's not new. Uh, because of the COVID, we had a very big push, not only in Brazil, but around the world, but especially in Brazil, because in the COVID, we put a, a spotlight on science and on the role and the purpose of, of the companies. So many companies have been discussing now what are the roles, and it's not only about selling products and, and, and services, it's a, a little bit more, and so companies have uh, must be concerned about their employees, their clients, their commu communities, and the environmental uh, issues as well. So ESG is about that. Uh, I don't believe, despite the fact that ESG is seen as a set of KPIs or metrics, I don't uh, see this way. I believe that uh, that ESG is more a, a, a culture, is the way that the company is managed, uh, taking into account all the stakeholders, not only the shareholders. So basically, ESG is about uh, uh, thinking about uh, thinking, considering uh, all the stakeholders in the in the decision making process. So rather than um, uh, analyzing single KPIs, which is basically what is uh, what has been done in in Brazil. So I believe that ESG is is um, something very new for some companies because we are in the middle of a big change of the capitalism. So we are leaving a, 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 an old system which, uh, in which the capitalism was based only in the shareholders. So uh, they believe that uh, maximizing value of a company was just by ma uh, uh, maximizing uh, the profits of, of, of the company. And new companies, they believe that by uh, integrating all the stakeholders in the decision-making process, the, uh, it will maximize the value of the company as a whole. And as a, as a side effect, the profit will uh, grow as well. So ESG is a decision-making process, is a culture, is not, uh, cannot be seen as a set of metrics. So as an intro, um, I, I believe that over the almost 30 years that I have been investing under the pillars of pillars of ESG, I changed my mind. In the beginning, I, I thought that uh, 
I could understand uh, how the company was was uh, uh, implementing ESG uh, through the metrics, but but it's not the, the right way in my belief. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabio. So I'd like to do the same question to Paula. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And again, thanks for the chamber for organizing such panel. I think it's very important that we spread that conversation and that debate about ESG as much as we can. Um, hard to add much on what Fabio said about the definition of ESG. So I would like to, to, to focus on telling you how does COZAN approach that, that theme, if you like, right? So um, I personally moved to the US in 2017 and the idea was to, um, to, to uh, you know, get closer to our shareholders, especially the holding shareholders who were at that point very concentrated here in the US. And we had a very clear goal at the time, which was to find uh, investors that had a more aligned long-term approach to investing like we had at the holding level when it comes to capital allocation. And so I was here in the office and I began to receive questions first from Europe, then from Europe and from the US about what was uh, Cozan's ESG strategy. And then um, I started to you know, study the theme and try and understand what exactly those three little letters uh, meant. And um, as part of that process, uh, we figured out very clearly that one, ESG was very much part of Cozan's DNA, and I'll and I'll, I'll talk about each of the each of the letters uh, in separate. And most importantly, uh, if there was a, a wave of increasing um, awareness and importance of ESG as a framework for um, investment decisions those shareholders willing to follow that path would likely be those who would have a longer term approach to investments and therefore more aligned with our uh, internal beliefs or our, our, our core DNA, right? So in, in a very simple way, we define the SG internally as being you know, values and management. So either you have the values or you don't, and then you know, when we looked at the, the, the statements that we had for each of our businesses, and you know, for those who don't know Cozan, we have four main businesses. So we have Rumo, which is largest railway in Latin America. We have Movie, which is a lubricants distribution company operating in uh, 13 countries. Um, we have Compass, which is our gas and power arm. And we have High Easy, which is a JV shell where we have sugar and ethanol production and fuse distribution. So, you know, giving you a few examples. So Rumo's you know, mission or Rumo's role is to develop competitive, reliable and efficient logistics to a country as big as Brazil to increase the competitiveness of, you know, for, for instance, for example, the agribusiness production in the Midwest region of Brazil. And, and by the way, globally, people account on the Midwest region of Brazil to supply probably around half of grains demand growth going forward. So you know, if, it, if this is not sustainable development, I struggle to understand, you know, um, what it is, then in the case of Raizen, a huge focus in helping clean up uh, the Brazilian energy matrix and especially the transportation matrix with, with ethanol, which for those who don't know, it's a very efficient solution for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and you, 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 can, you can see the difference between Sao Paulo and a city like Mumbai or whatever, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of quality of the air. And, and by the way, a 100% fueled um, ethanol car is less pollutant than an EV. Uh, if you consider the well to wheel, I mean, the entire value chain, uh, even in a country like Brazil, which has one of the cleanest um, uh, or one of the most sustainable energy matrices around the world. Uh, we now launch at Compass, which intends to, you know, contribute to the um, energy transition um, in the country through natural gas and integration of gas and power. So, uh, so this was very much part of the DNA or very much part of the businesses that we were um, involved and, and those were our values. 
Kozan is a company that is absolutely obsessed, for example, about security, security of our people, security of our operations. And we go beyond that. We, we, we think, you know, not we, we use the metrics of not having accidents as a matrix of operational excellence. Because at the end of the day, an accident is something that is not, not planned. And if you have an accident, it's because you're not planning properly. Because over the last many years, we've been the ones talking about long-term um, returns and investments uh, as opposed to pure short-term focus and quarterly results, sometimes even questioned by the market because of, of that, right? So to me, the whole, the whole basis, the whole DNA was very much there, right? And then ESG was essentially an amazing opportunity for us to tell a story in a way the financial markets were more and more willing to take it. And, and with that in mind, we, we, you know, we increased very much the focus in transparency, right? In, in increasing um, the level of transparency of all of our initiatives and our actions uh, connected to ESG. Um, we, we believe the pandemic was definitely a catalyst to that movement, especially in Brazil, uh, for reasons you know, mentioned by Fabio, which is, you know, pay attention to science. The nature is there, something's been told, you know, we have to do something about, um, about climate change. And if not, because we want to do something about climate change, just because of climate change, because climate change is changing, for instance, the water, the rain regime in many countries, which is affecting agribusiness and, and, and is increasing the cost of electricity in a country like Brazil, or because, you know, there's two, three, four, sequential great harvests in, 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 of sugar harvests in India because, you know, the weather or the rain season had, you know, ended up taking a different pattern compared to the, stat, the stats of the last 30 years. So, uh, you know, to me, it's very hard to separate, you know, the economic importance. And we actually like to think about ESG with a, with a second E, the E of economics, as has been defined by, um, you know, by other people. We think that's very important because the economic is the fourth pillar of sustainability. It's not sustainable if it's not su economically sustainable because you gotta you, know, you gotta create that that virtual cycle. It's important to think about ESG as a value creation tool because you know because people are more uh, concerned about you know climate change issues because the newer generation wants to you know, invest and work and buy products from companies that have that kind of, um, of, of conscious, that th those kind of, of values. So to me, it's absolutely important to dissociate ESG from strategy or ESG from value creation. And the only, the only way to make sure that this becomes a real trend is, you know, uh, acknowledging uh, the importance of all those three letters from, from a, a broader standpoint and even from an economic standpoint. And, you know, I don't think shareholders and stakeholders are ne necessarily in opposite uh, fields. Thank you, Paula. So on this question, uh, finally, I'd like to ask uh, Dan, if you could provide more color on, I think, the more macro aspect of ESG. Okay, well, first of all, good morning to everybody and thank you very much for the very kind invitation uh, from the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce and it goes on to talk about the SD. Um, I think that overall two things that I'd like to add to the previous panelists. Uh, one, as it was already discussed, uh, ESG is not a new, new concept in the sense of the preoccupation. It may be a new packaging, but it's not a new concept. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, just take, for example, the banking sector. If you take the S social from ESG, in fact, in the US, uh, community banking, for example, started back in the 60s with the concerns uh, of the 60s, actually trying exactly to, to make uh, banking more accessible to poor communities, to discriminated communities, and so on. Later on, uh, I think mainly with, uh, with Stockholm and Rio 92 and Kyoto in the 90s, the E uh, of environment came uh, more clearly uh, in the ESG idea. And finally, uh, in the late 90s, 
I think governance became a major factor in the ESG. So back in the early 2000s, there was already a lot of things happening. Uh, for example, on investment issues uh, in the issue uh, related to ESG. You have had uh, uh, before uh, disasters uh, of environmental nature that had major impacts on, uh, on share prices. I mean, one example is Bhopal in India with Union Carbide, the famous um, uh, environmental disaster uh, that essentially made the company change its name uh, effectively uh, and restarts almost. So ESG is not in a sense a new uh, idea. It, it is a new packaging that is developing quite a bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on as we go on. Uh, related to, to COVID, as I mentioned, I mean, COVID is a sh fairly short term issue that we're facing now. There are long, there's a fairly long history on ESG. I mean, I could mention that there was SARS and MERS and there was still ESG back then in the early 2000s. So what I think is interesting now for example, that is different than SARS or MERS. It's not only the, the science and the, the expansion of the pandemic uh, related to COVID, but is the economic side of things that Paula mentioned. Uh, what we are living now is a fairly large recession, global recession, uh, which we faced in, for a different reason in 2008. But we have very, very low interest rates. Uh, and this presents an opportunity and both an opportunity and a challenge on the ESG side. On the opportunity side is of course that when you have very low interest rates as an economist, I always learn that you discount the future pretty much like your present. So you're not so preoccupied about the future down the drain. You can wait or you can make changes, right? So that solar panel that you were not willing to invest uh, the capital because it was too expensive, now a household may be able to borrow to invest that solar panel and recuperate uh, the money of the investment much quicker or, or pay out the loan in much quicker terms because the interest rates are so low. On the other hand, of course, companies are strapped, are strapped uh, for cash. Uh, their leverage. So this may also cause a problem in their notions of abilities to invest a, in new technologies, uh, more productive practices, and um, better ESG uh, investments. So to, in a nutshell, for me, ESG is primarily related to good risk management practices, as I think that Paula uh, indicated. Uh, and also productivity increases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. So going forward with the second question, uh, this question goes first to Fabio and then to Dan. So uh, do you see any risks related to greenwashing and or uh, ESG washing going forward with the ESG agenda? Uh, could you please explain what it is, uh, greenwashing, the term greenwashing and the term ESG washing? and what uh, investors should be aware of. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think uh, my concept of, of risk is something that is uncertain. And this is not uncertain. It's already happening. It's, it's going to, to be big in the near future. So I, I'm very scared about uh, the green or uh, ESG washing or social washing uh, as, you, as, you, as you like. And it's something uh, which is related to pretend uh, something that you are that you are not. So uh, companies, either companies or or investors or managers, um, trying to sell uh, to to the others an image, but uh, in fact they're doing uh, very few about uh, either social or environmental issues uh, for their clients or or for the company. So it, it, it happened a lot in Europe. So in Europe, we have a new legislation starting next year. It's a, it's a, a taxonomy. Um, and many funds are going to 
have to change their names because many plants are have a label like ESG or green or sustainable. And when you, you, you take a look at the portfolio, they have nothing about sustainability in, in their investments or in their philosophy. And so uh, the regulator had to, 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 to act. And so many funds have lost the right to, uh, uh, to have this kind of, of label. So in Brazil, it's happening the same. And it's, it's very uh, complex because it is, as I said before, it is something new for Brazilians. In the, in the financial market, we have not be, been discussing uh, either um, human rights or environmental issues. And there are very complex uh, 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 matters. And uh, companies, uh, sustainable companies, um, were not uh, deserving higher valuation or higher multiples up to now. But now, uh, sustainable companies that are not uh, proving that are not sustainable have been deleted from a lot of investors' portfolios. So companies have to prove that they are sustainable or they are acting uh, uh, in, in taking uh, some, some measures about sustainability in some way. But sometimes this is not true. So they are either not uh, uh, addressing the core business or they are sometimes lying about their figures. It's important to bear in mind that the sustainability report is voluntary. Um, the data is selective. You, 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 you may present whatever you want. Uh, numbers are not audited and there's no, there's no uh, standardization. So for example, uh, if you would like to present your NPS, so, so how uh, your clients are su satisfied about your company or your product, you may uh, call your clients, you may have a uh, email, you, have, you may have different approaches to do that uh, calculation. So there's no standardization at all. So companies or either um, uh, managers can do whatever they want. And they are, are already doing that. So there's, there are some companies that, just to give an example, uh, it's, it's fictional, but let's say a company that are, for example, um, launching a, 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 a shirt, which uh, is made of sustainable cotton. And of course it's, it's good, but it, this is not the key factor for uh, apparel, the, the apparel sector. The key factors for apparel sector is uh, the uh, infant uh, workers or something related to, to uh, slavery. This is very key. Uh, CO2 emission is not very key for um, uh, the apparel sector or the, the retailer. So there are some companies that are putting a lot of focus in something that is not uh, the core and the investors are not they have no critic eye uh, at this moment to select who's who so this is is happening at the same time investors or especially in, individual investors uh, sometimes they come across with funds that sell themselves air as uh, esg or sustainable but at the end they are doing uh, 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 not much so I'm very scared about that. Uh, for the next two or three or four years, we'll have to, um, to, to, to leave with this. But in the future, I think uh, we will recover. Thanks, Fabio. So Dan, if you could uh, speak on that, it would be great. Yeah, so for me, this is one of the major um, issues, challenges in this, in this uh, arena. Uh, in part, this in economics would be one of the classic market failures, right? The failures of information. Uh, in part, because we, we don't really uh, have a clear definition of what is sustainable or what sustainability is. I mean, I have uh, research on that back in the 90s. There were 72 different definitions of sustainability in the literature. Now, uh, we all know it's good, we all want that, but uh, what is sustainability to you may be different than what is sustainability to me. 
um, being a, a dynamic modeler, I thought that I understood what it was. Uh, but when I got into this realm, uh, it became clear that it's more of a catchphrase than, than a mathematical equation. Uh, and, and I can give you a few examples to illustrate that. I remember back in the 2000s when I was working in, uh, with OECD and I was working in this issue, I contacted a large, a very large international bank uh, because of a mutual fund that they had uh, that used the name sustainable, sustainable development fund or something like this. And I realized that from the prospectus, there was no major difference between that fund and say investing in S&P 500 companies. So I asked, uh, how did they decide things? And they were of course obscure when I was talking to fund managers. I mean, they said they have a model and well, how do I know the model? And oh, that's proprietary information. So in essence, I was paying in administrative flat fees more to get the same outcome that I could get in a much cheaper fund. Well, I did what Fabio suggested, uh, implicitly at least. I called the regulator and I asked, well, how do they use the term sustainable? How do you accept this sort of term? Well, we don't. We care about the industries that they invest and their benchmarks. So if they say that their benchmark is the S&P 500, we want to know that they follow the S&P 500. If they say that they're going to invest in utilities, well, we want to know that they invest in utilities. If they say that they're going to invest in small caps, it's small caps. Sustainability is just a term in the title. It doesn't mean anything for the regulator. Another example happened to a venture capital fund in Brazil where they were actually trying to get uh, FSC, Forest Research Council certification on, uh, on a company that they were buying uh, to, to have sustainable forestry in the Amazon. And the moment that they went back to Sao Paulo, the manager of the company back in the Amazon decided that this Sao Paulo people don't know anything. And he has been there for many years and he knows where to get the wood that he needs. Well, if you get illegal logging uh, wood, Yet your FSC certification, which is a major cost, uh, is going to go down the drain. And uh, this is a reputational risk and a financial risk for the venture capital. Uh, another story is just imagine if all this organic industry that we have now, that essentially is primarily self-declared organic, you find out that it's not organic. Well, this has a reputational risk uh, to the whole industry, right? So the solution to that problem probably will come from two, two ways. One is the regulator itself that will have to, as Fabio indicated, begin to regulate over this information problem and the industry itself in a sense, in the same way that happened to the wine industry in Europe, when they try to, without the sour grapes or the bad apples, people that claim that they had a particular good wine and put a seal of approval which where there was no seal. So they started to have this denomination uh, type of, um, of, uh, of uh, certification, right? So most likely it will come from both. And usually in environmental issues, that's what you see. You see that companies that are doing well, that are managing well its risk uh, practices, they tend also to look at the market and see if this industry where they participate are doing the same. And if they don't, if they find a firm that is doing uh, cutting corners, let's say, they tend to uh, declare and, and show that firm to the regulator as well. So attitudes and, and actions can be taken. Uh, it's not an easy, uh, for me, it's one of the most complicated problems of this area of ESG, but hopefully with uh, more and more data, you'll be able to, to to come to grips with this information problem. Thank you, Dan. So going forward, uh, talking about the more practical side of ESG, uh, Paula, we are hearing a lot um, more and more about green bonds. So if you could please explain to, to our viewers what it is and its importance and benefits, that, that would be great. Yeah, so very simple terms. A green bond is a bond whose use of proceeds is dedicated to a project that helps reduce um, uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, and put, put it in a very simple way. Um, 
And, and then I would like to answer your question in, in two different parts. The first one is to throw a little bit uh, you know, of, of order of magnitude to that, to that opportunity and how important it is. I mean, if you think about, those are 2018 numbers, but you know, globally the assets under management between equities and bonds were about $185 trillion. Um, at that point, uh, there were estimates that, you know, ESG would account to about, to about five trillion. Uh, I've seen more more um, uh, or different different assumptions, and of course, they're very much related to the difficulty in defining what exactly ESG investing and ESG screening is, as Fabio uh, described it. But I mean, I've seen numbers as big as thirty billion, and then I've seen you know uh, estimates that you know. Uh, assets under management being using ESG as a screening or using ESG as a criteria could be, you know, as uh, higher than 40 billion. So the 40 billion is um, more than the US GDP and more than the Chinese GDP. So that's, this is a lot of money. And if this is a lot of money willing to, you know, be allocated to ESG related climate change related, socially related and or impact related investments. I think that's great news by all means. And, and again, the numbers are, are big by, by, by any way you wanna look at them, right? So my, my, my way of thinking about it is, there's a lot of money willing to work in favor of projects uh, that have a contribution. The fact that there is more and more money willing to work in this direction means that one way or the other, the cost of capital uh, should go down for those projects because they were gonna have a higher liquidity to be assessed in terms of, of, of money pool. And, and that's great news. So I think green bonds, social bonds, ESG related bonds, sustainable, sustainability related bonds, they are all you know, good news and good mechanisms for companies to fund good projects, right? And, and, and this is it. And then there's, there's more recently, you know, situations where, you know, the issuer attaches or, or accepts a penalty or a higher interest rate if the, the, uh, the targets set as part of the green bond are not met. So I think it's a pretty fair way of, um, you know, increasingly measure the benefits of, of, of this, those initiatives in their bag. And then the second part of the response is a bit of adapting ESG to emerging markets or adapting the, or the, 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 the green bond concept to emerging market economies like Brazil. And I, I want to give you the example that we had in-house with a green bond that was issued by Humo, our railway company. Okay. Um, I started... I mean, you can call it a, almost a pilgrimage, you know, with banks two and a half, three years ago, talking about our willingness to issue a green bond at Humo. And then the first reaction was, okay, understand. So you wanna raise money to electrify the railway? And then I'm like, no. I mean, Brazil is a continental country and still the, the transportation matrix in our country is still 60% truck based and a good good part of those trucks are still you know more of a mom and pop type business sometimes with 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 um, you know old old uh, trucks that are actually very uh, polluted so we're talking about investing in a railway that will allow for example grain producers in the midwest region to choose between using a railway that issues a lot less than a truck for transportation. That's what we're trying to do. And I tell you, it took me quite a lot of talking to, to get people to understand such reality, right? At the end of the day, we only managed to issue the green bond because on top of um, the benefit of providing an alternative solution that is um, way more efficient and, and less pollutant compared to the trucks. Uh, we were also committing to increasing the efficiency of our locomotives and therefore committing to a 15% reduction in, 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 the, in the carbon footprint of our operations in five years, right? But my challenge is 
people need to understand that in a country like Brazil, the focus or, or the priority might be a little different, right? Compare, for instance, to something that is going on in, in, in Europe, right? Maybe they're talking about, they're rightly talking about electrifying railways in, in Europe, but that's not the Brazilian reality. And I think that's a very important thing for people to, to understand and, and, and value the initiatives um, in the case of Brazil. That's great, thank you. Uh, so Dan, I would like to hear your thoughts on that as well. Okay, so uh, green bonds, I mean, it, it's, it's, I believe it started with um, about 10 years ago or so with my previous employer, the, the World Bank, right? And essentially the idea is to, to, to capture um, monies to uh, put on, let's say, sustainable investments. Um, primarily, uh, it was focused on, uh, on um, energy related investments, renewable energy and maybe energy efficiency, but primarily renewable energy linked to, to climate change uh, concerns. Uh, companies and even countries uh, started to do this as well. Now, one question that I always ask uh, at the World Bank and, and I, I ask here as well is, well, if there is no advantage in terms of the interest rate side of things, in other words, if the market is not somehow subsidizing me, the, the land, the borrower, to, to, to undertake uh, certain uh, projects, and I have to earmark my, the money that I'm borrowing for those projects, why would I choose a, to issue a green bond as opposed to a non-denominated bond that I can have a lot more, um, a lot more scope to use the, the money, right? Um, so that, 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 that question remains unanswered. Uh, and I can see the, the marketing value of issuing a green bond. I mean, uh, again, we talked a little bit about this uh, in the previous section with Fabio, right? I mean, to claim that we're actually doing something sustainable is, is good, but you don't get the differential uh, that I would expect or want if the market really wants um, uh, sustainable investments. And uh, this is a challenge today, right? Because today with interest rates so low, it's really very hard to differentiate significantly from one investment to the other investment because essentially they're very close to zero anyway. This is a challenge on the green bond uh, arena. And I think that there are uh, hopefully ways in the future that we will be able to tag much better and, and, and check if, if the market actually is willing uh, to put their money where the mouth is, so to speak. Thank you, Dan. So before we, we, we move forward to the last question and closing remarks, we have one question here. And uh, to our viewers, if you have any question, please do so by using the Q&A tab. So James is asking, how do you see the value of compulsory government manage annual ESG sustainability reporting, which sets standards and works well in a growing number of countries? So uh, to our panelists, if you, if you want to take this one. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I mean, of course, there's a, 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 a debate on whether it should be compulsory or not, right? And, uh, but, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think reporting is important because you got to be able to, you know, tell your, tell the story with, um, you know, with, with, with numbers, you have to be able to tell the story with, you know, someone auditing the story that you're telling, because we, there is a huge challenge in, in a way of normalizing the ESG metrics and standards and the way you report. So the more people come to, you know, uh, commit to reporting, I think, we move into the right direction. I mean, again, I don't think we should be creating, you know, there's always a debate on whether we should be creating new rules or we should be, be adapting, um, you know, rules to this and that. I think, you know, there's, there's of course an optimum, uh, a point where, you know, the metrics and the taxonomy and the rules are clear and then everyone tries to, 
uh, be as close as possible to the rules that were established because I think that's the only way you kind of standardize things and allow people to compare really, you know, companies that are doing things for real and companies that are greenwashing it or, or, or funds that are greenwashing as discussed uh, in the previous question. So um, I think I think transparency and communication is is, is key for that. We, we need you know more companies disclosing their their ESG standards. At the end of the day, you know thinking about the future, I think you know the sustainability report shouldn't be a different document compared to the company's annual report. At the end of the day, those are the same things. If we believe that ESG is part of the strategy and vice versa. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure if Fabio or Dan want to want to comment on this, but uh, we have another question here from Anna. Uh, what is the importance for the U.S. investors uh, uh, by choosing their investment uh, uh, related to the companies, uh, the Brazilian companies adopting ESG uh, metrics or policies or I don't know. Just 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 what is the importance for the U.S. investor? If, when they look to the Brazilian companies and their ESG standards or metrics or policies? I can take this. Well, uh, first of all, it's it's very important to um, to speak about a misperception of uh, many investors or many people that don't follow close uh, very closely uh, the matter. Uh, a lot of people believe that ESG is a a product, so renewable energy or um, uh, cars, uh, battery cars, and so on and so forth are ESG. Uh, ESG. ESG is more related to a process rather than a product. And so uh, companies uh, should, uh, regardless of the sector, the companies should uh, change the way uh, they are uh, being managed and also the, the way they, they report. And there are, there are several uh, academic papers proven, proving that companies that are managed this way and reporting this way are better companies, are high quality companies. And these companies uh, uh, deliver better results. And also uh, the, the securities, either bonds or uh, equities perform, uh, perform better. But there are several, several academic papers uh, proving that. So investors, Yes, the American investors, but not only American investors, the Brazilian investors, the European investors, investors everywhere should uh, 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 move towards a, a, a ESG um, uh, investing mindset because at the end you are uh, talking about better companies, uh, high quality companies and so on and so forth. So uh, we have to change our mindset and um, the misperception that investing in an ESG is only about uh, uh, wind energy or um, green food or, and so on and so forth is, is wrong. Uh, any company in the world could have a better standards of, of management and reporting. And this is uh, what ESG is about. Uh, myself, I, I have a, a different belief in my fund, for example, I have a a very uh, comprehensive is, uh, exclusion list. So I don't invest in several sectors or companies, but this is very pragmatic. I just believe that sooner or later, uh, fossil fuel companies or uh, coal companies or some uh, uh, meat companies, they will have uh, uh, bad times because carbon is going to be regulate, re regulated. They have to pay for the pollution or uh, we as human beings have been using um, natural resources for centuries without paying that. It, it's very expensive. So the planet cannot, uh, is suffering a lot and, and cannot handle this kind of, 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 uh, of behavior. So sooner or later, uh, Currently, two thirds of the, the global GDP is already paying for carbon. So I believe that uh, other sectors which are exposed to pollution 
are going are not going to perform as well as they are performing today. So in my pragmatic view, I have a, a very a long exclusion list of companies, not only because of their sectors, but also because of the, the corporate governance. But ESG is for everyone. So I believe that uh, investors, uh, no matter where they are, should um, uh, uh, focus on ESG companies because they're bad investments. Felipe, I can address this directly. Um, many of our members, both on the banking side and on the buy side, have full department for ESG. The, my previous employer, uh, who's a member at HFPC, had a global research ESG research group. And I, mean, I know that similar things in Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Citibank. And then we look on the buy side, another member of ours, Alliance Bernstein, is, is promoting a number of uh, seminars along with the Emerging Market Investors Alliance, which is purely focused on ESG. So it's already adopted. I spoke to uh, many of the fund managers in Boston. BlackRock is the most, they're not in Boston, they're the ones that are the most out there. But you have Fidelity, Loomis Sales, uh, uh, BNY Mellon here in New York, uh, all uh, choosing their portfolios based on these criteria or evaluating the ESG consequences of their investment. So this is already here. It's already part of the uh, uh, the heuristic and the process. Thank you, John. And thank you, Fabio. And moving forward to our last topic here, and I know you guys already said something about it, but I would like to hear from you uh, the future of ESG, the challenges, and what do you see going forward uh, with this agenda? I would like to start with Dan, please. Okay, the, the way that I see the future here, it's uh, the following uh, way. I think that um, one key point that I made and, and has been uh, reflected in other comments is that ESG is really having good manage, risk management practices in companies and industries. Uh, so having those good management, risk management practices means also uh, being able to use information effectively. I, don't think that anybody would want to invest in a company that has enormous hidden liabilities or contingent liabilities. I mean, you really want to know those things uh, up front. Now, the future in this looks very interesting in my side. Part of it is we, the big difference between today, for example, and back in the 90s, and that we are much able to uh, analyze and to um, gather huge amounts of data. And one of the problems that we have in say environmental social issues is that it's data in this area is difficult. I mean, just let me give you an example. I mean, it's much easier for you to measure um, an emission output ratio of a company and of the pipe emission uh, of a company or affluence of a sewage uh, system than actually to understand the impact in the environment, right? But you as an individual, you're interested in your welfare about how the environment is. You're not interested in about this specific company of how much they are polluting, say, Baja Beach in, in Rio. You really want a clean beach. Uh, that's what you enjoy. So you are, we are moving towards being able to analyze uh, these sort of things much better. And that's, that's uh, number one. And this is, this is because of big data, because of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Um, with this, uh, there is something else related. I mean, we have discussed about certification a little bit. And we talked about, uh, I think that Fabio mentioned about his interests. And we have, for example, certification on processes, right? ISO 14,000, it's a certification of processes. But we need to develop ways of certifying performance. That's, that's, uh, that's a lot more complicated. In other words, I don't want to know if the plan has the right machines in place only. I want to know if the owner of the plant is turning on the machines. That for me is important. Um, so those certifications is, uh, is, 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 it's probably the most uh, on the certification side 
it's the, the future uh, and it's linked to this ability to, to, to analyze and to gather data. Finally, also linked with this ability, I personally would like to see a move much closer to the investors themselves. In other words, I, as, a, as let's say as an investor, I don't want to have intermediaries telling me what is a environmentally uh, and social and governance uh, appropriate investment. I want to be able to see by myself. And this is linked to what Paula has said in terms of transparency. And I will be, want to be able to, let's say, penalize those uh, companies that I see as doing harm through measurements and premiate those companies as I see as doing well. And I want to be able to put my own money directly into those companies, either buying shares, buying bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, you name it, right? Uh, and I would hope that uh, financial uh, instruments will allow me to do that uh, in the future. Actually, that's one area that I'm working on right now. And, and I think it's quite possible, particularly as we are become more and more able to measure, uh, say, carbon emissions, biodiversity, and things like this. That's great. Thank you, Dan. So, Fabio, if you, if you, can, if you could please talk about the future of ESG. I know we talked about that uh, earlier today, but uh, just your closing remarks and how do you see ESG moving moving forward? I believe that I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the future of ESG in Brazil and not only in Brazil, in the world. And for two reasons. First, because we are in the middle of a, of a transition of generation. So my generation, for example, uh, was not aware or was not conscious about and the environmental issues uh, was not conscious about the so social issues, but this new generation, the Z generation is, is full of purpose. This Z generation uh, strongly believes that uh, uh, inclusion and diversity uh, brings value to, to companies. This Z generation uh, is very committed to, uh, to environmental aspects and, and issues. So I believe that as time passes, uh, the, the people from this generation is moving from a condition of uh, simple consumers, um, and then they will uh, grow in, in their careers and they will be leaders in, in their organizations and not, not only in private organizations, but in, in, the, in public organizations as well. And so they will become um, more relevant consumers, they will uh, uh, prefer brands that are committed to, to, their, uh, to the same values and they will avoid products and, or brands that are not aligned to, to their values. Uh, and so I strongly believe that this transition of generation will create uh, a, a very good momentum uh, for, for ESG. And so ESG will not uh, be a niche, but will be a mainstream. And not only that, um, it's very important to bear in mind that a lot of people in the world, they, um, they react only th th when, there is a, when there is a threat. So uh, the climate problem, um, the climate change has been supported uh, by the scientists for more than three or four decades. However, only now we are in, a, in the middle of a, a big problem. And if we don't act now, probably we'll uh, have a, a, a problem in the future for, for this planet. So the, leaf, uh, the, uh, the life in this plan, planet is, is going to be, I would say, uh, almost impossible if we don't act now. And so because of the emergency uh, and because of the urgency, uh, more and more people will be engaged with this agenda. So I believe that ESG is going to grow in time and it's not uh, a tranny, it's something that is going to become mainstream. Um, and those who are not aligned to ESG principles, uh, probably they will become the niche in the future. So those who are still investing 
in, in, in uh, fossil fuel, fuel or uh, uh, coal or s some other um, uh, products that are harmful to, to the environment or uh, companies that are not um, advocating against the racism or homophobia or uh, uh, social issues, they're not addressing social issues, are going to be um, a, a small niche in the future. Uh, finally, Paula, if you can please provide your thoughts on the future of ESG and uh, what we should be aware going forward. Yeah, um, um, I, I think I want to touch on a point that that Dan made. He talked about risk management, and I think we all talked about good management, right? As as being, you know, the fundamental reasons why uh, ESG investing uh, probably makes sense, right? Or if you think about companies that follow that kind of framework to take decisions, are our, our good companies, are our, our well managed companies, and and this is a strong belief for us. Um, at Crozan and, and for me in particular. But I think the future is sustainability has always been risk management in many companies or a license to operate or assuring that, you know, if you're an oil company, you're, you're protecting or you're, you're being careful not to have a water spillage that will be a big, a big headache and a big nightmare if it, if it ever happens and, have, and will have a, a huge financial cost, right? And I think the most fundamental shift is going from peer risk management or license to operate to becoming uh, a source of value creation, to becoming business opportunities. And you know what we're seeing is that not only people are more willing to use renewable energy or invest in renewable energies, uh, uh, is because they're they're growing more efficient because they're go they're growing cheaper. So you know they're becoming more and more. Um, uh, good businesses to invest in because customers are more willing to use it, right? So again, I think we're back to the beginning of the conversation that this is a major trend, is a behavior trend, is a generational trend. You, you I mean, a bunch of many, but a bunch of names that we can use to, to think about uh, this is something that is, or at least seems to be unlikely to change direction, right? I think it's the opposite. I think, you know, awareness is increasing. And, and if that's so true, that means the companies that will succeed in the future are the companies that take those things into consideration because that's how customers will decide on products to buy. That's how investors will decide, will decide on shares to buy. And this is how you know, people will be choosing their jobs in the future. And this is how you know, success will be defined at the end of the day. So again, it's a, a pretty pragmatic, view that at the end of the day it's it's gonna it's gonna move forward because it makes a lot of sense right and then just back to another point that that they both made about the metrics and the taxonomy and the and the transparency i think you know not only people uh, want to be able to measure or want to be able to invest um, in 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 those companies in projects and in, in in whatever but also it's, a, it's, I mean, we're seeing, I mean, look at what's happening in Brazil. There's a huge number of, of, of people moving or buying equities because interest rates are so low, right? So there's a lot of newcomers to this, to this equity or bond invest, in, investing world. And, and they need clear, um, clear metrics and clear standards. And, and they need to be able to, you know, choose based on uh, bulletproof metrics that they're, that they're, 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 you know, the companies are indeed uh, delivering on, on their promises because there's a global move of investments growing more passive or through ETFs. And those guys need, you know, the standards, the indexes to follow. And so evolving in terms of the measurement, I think it's a key element to make sure the trend continues in the right direction as well. Thank you so much, Paula. So I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Rogério just asked, do you believe that COVID-19 pandemic will change the way companies value and approach ESG? I think that that was uh, the title of our webinar. So that would be great if, if someone could take this one. I think it definitely speeded up the process. 
to start with, because, you know, all of a sudden people figured out that, you know, there's something going on, <laughs> you know, science is telling you something and you better react before it's too late. So if any, I think the COVID um, accelerated that process and it definitely brought the social to a higher standard or to a, you know, a higher focus, if you like. Investors in general, over time, they've always looked at governance because at the end of the day, if you're a fund manager, manager and you have to you know, look at companies' uh, governance, then you know, they, social was something a little bit you know, fuzzy. Shall we check they have you know, any, any big issues there or let's make sure there's no, there are no hidden skeletons in the, in the wardrobe, but otherwise we can invest. And then environment is something pretty new, right? So I think um, that's that's the, the COVID did accelerate the people's awareness on those things, and 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 this is good, and it's great to see uh, investors asking those questions. Because of the COVID, some companies have been uh, uh, have been re rethinking about their their role and their purpose. Um, it's not only about selling products or services; they have to think about their clients, their uh, employees, and the communities as well. So, so more and more companies um, were affected by the COVID in the sense of thinking of their own responsibility. And so they are implementing um, different measures and not only philanthropy, but also have a, a more social uh, view in managing and, and making uh, the decision process more human. Uh, Dan, you told me that you want to add something to that, so if you could. Yeah, uh, I think that this question is really uh, um, an empirical question, right? So uh, for me, uh, first of all, I, I think this is a journey. I mean, uh, it's not a journey that uh, it's severely changed by even a pandemic. I think it's a journey that goes back for, for many years and will continue. Now, bringing specifically the pandemic, as I mentioned, I think that zero interest rates in general are good for, for environment, I mean, and, and investments uh, on environment. Having said that, the IMF just came out with, with its uh, global uh, financial stability report uh, uh, in October this year. And, they have a chapter exactly on this, on corporate and COVID and ESG. And their argument is that a lot of companies are delaying, say, investments in new technologies and things like this because of the uncertainty uh, that you have related to, uh, to COVID. So at the end of the day, you have two, 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 two uh, positions that, that are empirical uh, in nature to find out. Um, I think that basically for us to get out of this economic mess that we're now, we basically need uh, a major productivity boost because uh, the way that we're spending money, I don't think it's sustainable, but perhaps John has a more uh, based opinion on that one. That's a different seminar. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. So this is the end of our webinar, the first one. I'd like to thank you, you know, Fabio, Paula, and Dan again for joining us. Uh, the first one, we, we, we thought about inviting the right people uh, to do the job and uh, we were right. So thank you again. I would like to pass the word to John. Uh, thank you very much, Felipe. That was fascinating. I really learned a lot today. Uh, thank you again, and thank you to all the panelists for a really excellent discussion. We are planning many, many, many more webinars on environment, social, and governance in the future, so um, be ready for those. I would also like to thank once again Kosan for the sponsorship. Before I close, I wanted to remind attendees that on Thursday, 17th of November, we will host a webinar on wealth management now and in the future at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time and 11 a.m. Uh, at 12 a.m. Uh, 12 noon in Brasilia time. We hope to see you then. Uh, in the meantime, please stay healthy and in good spirits. Thank you all once again.